In true author interview fashion, today's guest has brought really cool stories along with him, including the fact that his book is being turned into an audio drama. Now, I am incredibly excited for this conversation. You've met him here before on the channel. His name is George Soroy, and he is the author of Ever Upward. Today, we're going to break down everything you need to know about his book and the behind the scenes of what he's working on right now that you do not want to miss, and I most certainly do not want to miss because I've learned some really fun things that we might need to be implementing into my author life as well. Any my name is George Soroy. I am the host and producer of the Excelsior Journeys podcast, as well as the podcast From Duck Till Dark outside the Marvel Studios. I am also an audiobook narrator with over a dozen titles to my name, and I am the author of Ever Upward, part two in the Excelsior Journey, a young adult science fiction trilogy. And don't worry, part three is in development. It is coming out. And I'm really excited because, George, we've had you on the platform before. We've talked about your first book, Excelsior, and yes. this is the sequel. So what do we need to know about Ever Upward? Where are we joining this journey? Well, we're joining it very, very quickly after the events of the first Excelsior story. Um, at the same time, I made a point to give enough information so that way those who feel the need to just go ahead and jump right into part two without knowing part one, you can go ahead and do that. You you can go ahead and um, do that and not get lost. Um, I obviously personally recommend that you read part one first. It definitely gives you that, uh, that additional insight into the character because um, what part one does is it starts off with... Um, it starts off on Earth. It starts off with uh, with my main character, Matthew Peters, and he is learning of the task that is ahead of him, the destiny that he has in front of him. And with Ever Upward, he has achieved that. Now it's a matter of, OK, what do you do next? What exactly is the mission of Excelsior? What is it that he is on this on this Earth, on this planet to do? Because he's not on Earth anymore. He's on the planet that uh, that Excelsior himself created at the dawn of the universe. Um, we're going to go a lot deeper into the mythology in Ever Upward. You're going to uh, see a lot more of the planet itself, and it's going to be a a whole a whole new story that shows that uh, that even though Matthew Peters is now the inherited god in human form that he is as Excelsior. He is not um, he is not infallible and it's his mistake that really gets things going because something that he does is what eventually basically kind of dooms the uh, the the inhabitants of his planet to an early death by accelerating the atmosphere to cater to him instead of to everyone else. Ooh. That is really interesting. So what was your inspiration behind creating this new planet? Why did we move it off of Earth? And what does it look like as you're creating that? Well, he he was always going to come from another planet. He always had to be someone who was part of the many gods that were responsible for the creation of the universe. That is something that uh, that, that was a part of his mythology back when I first created him in 1992. Uh, we are celebrating his 30 year anniversary of existence. And uh, so I am very excited about that. And the the different ideas that uh, that I was able to hold on to after all these years, I'm really, really thrilled with. And um, if I still had those steno notebooks from way back when, they would include those elements about how how Excelsior got to where he is, how he started off as, one of the, as I said, one of the many gods that were responsible for the creation of the universe. The main thing with uh, with Excelsior is that he took so much time dedicating himself to cre making this one particular planet, the fourth planet in what would eventually be the DNAB star system, into this jewel that was going to outshine all the other planets in the universe. And he took so much time that all the other that everything else that was happening around him was was changing. All the other gods had accomplished their mission. They had rejoined the center of the universe. And there is this one guy who is holding so much 
pride in everything that he's done, that that pride itself had built up and built up and built up to the point where it actually separated from himself and created its own entity, which wound up being the real his own anta antagonist, really, because he started off as someone who who had a job to do and he just refused to accept it as finished. There are a lot of authors that will basically say the same thing. There was um there was a great story about um about a particular artist. William Friedkin told this story during uh, the the documentary of the of uh, the Exorcist that there was uh, there was this one artist, I think his name was Bonard, but he was he went to the Louvre, he saw his painting there and he ducked under the 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 ropes and started tinkering with it. And it wound up getting the point of the, the attention of the security guards. And they were like, what are you doing? And he's like, no, this is me. This is my work. And I, I just need to change this here. And the security guards were just like, it's in the Louvre. You have to walk away from it. And so that's something that a lot of people really feel that they need to eventually do. They say that uh, perfection is the enemy of done. And that's what uh, that's basically what this is. You know, he has been constantly just feeling that he needs to get this thing just right and needs to really just get it just right. It has to be perfect, has to be perfect. And that becomes the downfall of this character because he was just so insistent on that. And I feel like that's a really good point because a lot of us are perfectionists. We want to make sure we're putting our best foot forward and we're really spending a lot of time and effort. We also use that as an excuse to not put ourselves out there. Yes. But realizing that there are consequences to every action that we take, both to move us forward and to hold us back and with the people around us is a really interesting foundation for a storyline. And I really like that you kind of added in that social commentary to what you were creating. So as you were developing your characters and you were then working on this second story, mm -hmm. what was your thought process behind where you were going to take the second book? I knew that there was going to be a... A, a much more powerful force that was going to be just kind of waiting in the wings. Um, but at the same time, I didn't want to, I didn't want to make the first, uh, the first antagonist, uh, Danak and Nocturar. I didn't want to shortchange them in any way. Um, but I just knew that there was like, there was someone who was far more powerful kind of waiting in the wings. And we learned that this was, that the main reason why that adversary still exists is because of Excelsior's insistence on not obeying the rules that were put in front of him. Uh, he is someone who was, if if he were to um, completely vanquish his enemy in human form, uh, then he would leave that planet. His, his job would be done. He would rejoin the gods at the center of the universe. And he didn't want to do that because he didn't want to leave this planet. He didn't want to leave his people. And so what he did was he basically created a loophole where he took the life force of his enemy, imprisoned it in an orb and sent that out into deep space. So he's still out there, but at the same time, he can't cause any damage. But by doing that, he has opened the door for his, for his enemies to gain strength. And they wind up basically just kind of taking over the planet because of the of the mistakes that he himself made. So this is a god. This is as flawed a god as you can possibly imagine because he is constantly making one mistake after another and we see that with our main character Matthew Peters when he creates this mistake through no fault of his own. He doesn't he didn't mean to do it. He obviously had had his good intentions, but those intentions wound up being the catalyst that sends everyone else on his planet to ruin. And the fact that the elders that are there are really kind of getting on Matthew's case about that, it kind of you know makes them seem somewhat ignorant because this has been the story of Excelsior's existence this whole time. Uh, he is always someone who makes mistakes and he's always trying to figure out ways to fix those mistakes in, and or at least like put a bandaid on them and then move on. And so he's he's a fun character to uh, to really explore. And it just seems like every move that he makes is basically just like, oh, why are you doing that? And but at the same time, you know, like he's got enough humanity in him where he will make those kinds of mistakes. 
And, um, and I, I really enjoyed that. You know, like I didn't want him to be suddenly infallible just because he has become, he has gone from Matthew Peters to now being Excelsior. I didn't want to keep that, um, that, that vulnerability with him, you know, like um, I didn't want to take that away from him. So he's got a lot of issues that he still has to deal with. They just happen to be magnified now that he is who he is. I love that. And I'm a big fan of flawed characters. I do not like when we create characters that are perfect or that they cannot fail in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And so being able to develop those in a very strong capacity is the sign of a very good writer. So how do you go about developing characters with flaws like this? Um, I really just kind of keep an eye on myself. Um, I, I ask myself, like, um, you know, what would I do? with this and then what are the consequences of my own actions and um because i you know i i'm very i'm very much of the mindset of just like i know i'm going to screw this up <laughs> and so um so that's kind of you kind know, of what i feel like is always like i'm very very you know when when you're dealing with anxiety and depression that's that can that can slow down the works in your head i actually had um um, had recently gotten myself um, diagnosed by with not having adult ADHD. I was very relieved to hear that that I don't have it. Um, but the doctor that worked that uh, worked with me on it said that what you're dealing with right now is a you're dealing with basically a computer virus. It's slowing things down in your head, and it's it's a mix of anxiety, depression, self doubt, and fatigue. And I was like, wow, that's Okay. So that's, that's dealing with quite a bit. And that answers a lot of questions too. So, and, you know, having those issues, you know, like they will, uh, if you make a mistake, then you're going to beat yourself up for making that mistake. And that's going to open the door for you to making more mistakes. And that's something that I am very familiar with. And that's something that I feel like it's something that I'm not the only one dealing with that. So if I can illustrate that in some way, then I'm then I'm in good shape there. Do you feel like now having this information about yourself and your own life has impacted how you're writing your characters going through similar things? It definitely helped um, this uh, earlier this year because um, one of the things that I'm, that I'm also working on right now is I just recently delivered to a um, to a group on the Clubhouse app called the Five Two Nine Club. They're a great, wonderful, creative group, and they are doing. They're looking for material to be turned into audio dramas to be performed on the Clubhouse app. And so I had an opportunity to adapt the first book, Excelsior, and take something that was seven hours. It took seven hours to narrate as an audiobook and squeeze it down into one hour. And so you're basically like, you're getting rid of a lot of material. It definitely came out as of right now to more than one hour, but it, um, you know, I, I still have some more editing to do, but I wanted to at least deliver a finished script. And I'm really glad I did that, but that um, it allowed me to get more insight into Matthew Peters. And so I realized that there was a lot of, there was an opportunity for even more angst with this character. Um, and someone that really needed to kind of like get it out there in, in some way, you know, he's dealing with a whole lot of dealing with the pressure of being tasked with this, with this new job that's going to take him away from everything that he knows and not even believing that he's worthy of doing that job in the first place. And so having, having gone through things myself and having, um, you know, people insisting that I am, uh, that I should be doing this, 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 and this, and then I'm letting them down if I'm not doing it. That's, that's something that's always on my mind. And it's something that I, I feel like is a great opportunity to really kind of add to that character. And so by doing this adaptation, it was, it was a real, it was it was an amazing experience and getting to add even more angst to that character that wasn't even in the latest iteration of the book because Excelsior went through 
three different versions. It went through self-published in 2010. Then it got picked up by a small press in 2013. And then it got picked up by another small press in 2017. And each version is different, is vastly different. And so now where he is and um, the element that I was able to really add to his angst and, and really just kind of um, really make sure I was showing and not telling. So that way his angst and his anger were coming out in different ways. Um, that was, that was a real, that was a real experience getting to take what I learned la just last year and adapt and bring that into the character to amplify those feelings even more. I love that you were able to use an adaptation, something outside of what you wrote inside of your story to learn mm -hmm. more about your character. And I think that's a really valuable lesson for people who are jumping into the writing world because yeah. it doesn't just have to be about what you're creating inside of your manuscript. There are other ways to learn and to grow and to enhance and elevate what you're doing as a writer within what you're doing with your characters, but outside of your manuscript. And I feel like that's something we don't talk about very much as writers, the work that goes into learning and understanding and fleshing out what we're creating outside of the written manuscript. Do you feel like that's a fair assessment? Absolutely. And and I defy, I, I not even defy, like I challenge all of my fellow authors um, to take one of your works and adapt it to a different format, um, adapt it to a different medium, whether it's an audio drama, whether it is a pilot episode for a series, whether it's a screenplay, whether it's a play, you know, something, you know, just take one of your stories and and adapt it to a different, to a different medium because there are so many people that are out there and I've, I've seen it on, I've seen it in different Facebook groups and it drives me nuts to see people just saying like um, that, that they are insistent on being, you know, they, they say like, I would want to, you know, sit in the, in the, in the cast, in the, sit in on the casting and I would want to have, you know, like every, every, you know, bit of control and I would not want them to change a thing. Well, it doesn't, work that way. Uh, you have to be used to the fact that your work is going to change and you have to be open yeah. to that change. If we weren't, if, if all writers were not open to that kind of change, then, you know, like you can, you can say this for what you want, but those Harry Potter adaptations would not be the success that they are because too many people would say, you know, like, you know, JK Rowling would have said, you know, do not change a thing. And then all of a sudden we have three movies for just Goblet of Fire and with just one movie focused on, on the Quidditch World Cup. And it would have been just such a slog to get through because that book doesn't really pick up until almost halfway through. So it's, it's something that people really need to really need to come to grips with. Their work is going to change. It, you know, like if you want it to get out there, then other people are going to take liberties with it. You have to make your peace with that. And you need to see, you know, like sort of like if you can't beat them, join them. So try, try just, you know, taking one of your works and adapt it to a different medium and see what happens. You're going to wind up learning a lot more about your story. You're going to uh, learn a lot about what is expendable and what isn't. Give it a shot. You never know what uh, what can wind up coming out of that. And that's really a great learning experience because you get to try new things and you get to see what works and what doesn't. You learn a little bit more about it. And if it goes well, maybe something cool comes of it. Yeah. And if it doesn't, you still educated yourself in a really strong way. But I like the point that you made that once you create content, it's going to change and you have to be okay with that, especially in the book world. Even if you're looking at getting a traditional book contract, the second you sign that contract, you sign away your rights to be able to say anything about anything. And mm -hmm. if they require you to change a character or remove a side character or upend the entire ending of your story, you no longer get to say it has to say the same because you signed away those rights. So even yep. from that smallest part of signing a book contract to something like adapting it for a movie or a TV series, things will be taken out of your control once you sign away those rights. And you have to be okay with understanding that it's now a business and it's now a transaction, no matter mm -hmm. what course you are taking inside of this industry. George, do you have final thoughts on writing and how people can be actively working inside of the publishing industry? 
Um, basically just the main thing I just have to say is keep writing. And I say that as someone who might come off as somewhat hypocritical because part three, uh, greater glory has been uh, a real slog to get through over the past few years. But at the same time, it's something that is always, it's always on my mind. It's something that I want to make sure I get right. And maybe I'm making the same mistakes that Excelsior made where he just wanted it to be perfect. It's not going to be perfect, you know, right, right at the start. So um, the main thing you've got to do is just figure out what your story is and get it out there because um, I myself am very story driven when it comes to my writing. Um, and I love a good meaty story and then seeing where, where the characters take it, you know, they're, they're not just along for the ride. They have a say in, in where things go as well. So you can start off with something very basic and then blow it up a little bit more and to see where it can go and then add a little bit more to it and then add a little bit more to it. You're going to be shocked at where things go. There is so much that went into ever upward that I did not expect to be there at all when I first came up with this story back in 1992 and 1993. Um, but, you know, like those elements that I really, you know, that I really loved from back then, they're in there. And I'm thrilled with that. But the everything that's come at, as after the fact, after the first book came out, the, the ideas that, you know, that, you know, that, that compounded one on top of the other, they are uh, just so wonderfully invaluable, and they're a big part of why, to this day, I consider Ever Upward, part two in the Excelsior journey, to be the best thing I've ever written to date. I love that. George, where can everybody get their hands on copies of your books? Uh, you can find it on you can find it on Amazon. It's actually um, it's actually you can also find it in all the all the main retailers. So you can find it on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Uh, you can actually go to he's got it.com and and order. Um, I have a limited amount of copies left of Excelsior ever upward and the five part serial from parts unknown. That's it's its own entity, but at the same time, there's one little element that kind of links the two universes. And um, it's one of those things where you can't really, you can't really find it until I, throw out the little clue for it but if you go to he's got it.com and go to the store you can request sign copies from me directly and um and you can also find the audiobooks on audible for both ever uh both excelsior and ever upward the one for from parts unknown is in development that's actually going to be released as a hybrid audiobook slash podcast so that's going to be a lot of fun to come out with as well that's amazing. And where can everybody connect with you online? You can find me everywhere. You can find me on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Um, I'm trying to get my LinkedIn profile back up and running again. You can find me on TikTok um, at Excelsior Journeys. And uh, thanks to you, you can find me on Clubhouse because you were the you were the in, um, invitor um, to get to uh, to open me up into that amazing world that has done so much for myself, for my podcast. And now because of this opportunity with the 529 Club for my writing as well. So um, so here I am thanking you again for, for something amazing happening to me. And we're going to have to have you back when we hear more about the audio drama that you are creating, because I want to hear all about the behind the scenes of this. Thanks so much for joining us today, George. Thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. Be sure to hit that subscribe and notification bell because in our upcoming videos, we're going to continue to help you learn how to navigate the book and publishing world and bring on really cool authors just like George to answer your questions, teach you about their books, and give you a new opportunity to look into the publishing world and see what you never knew was actually possible inside of this community. If you have questions for George, drop those down below. We'll be monitoring your comments. And if you have a guest that you would like to see on the show, let me know who I should be interviewing next. Drop your favorite authors down below. Give them a shout out. Give them a link and I'll see what I can do to bring them on the show. Until then, subscribe, hit the notification bell because we're dropping daily videos to help you level up in the book world, in the publishing world, with your writing, with the books that you're reading, and more inside of this platform. I'll see you in the next episode.